So I give you two matrices, and they're big matrices. And I ask you to compute their matrix product. Okay, so n, n is huge. And the question is, how many field operations does it need? Yeah. So, well, what would you do by hand? What would you do? You would start, you would start computing inner products, right? So there are n squared outputs here, n squared entries in the output. Each one is an inner product. And each inner product will take you like two times n operations. So you can do it in two n cubed, right? That's not so hard. So that's an upper bound. It's also not so hard to see, so because there are n squared outputs and they're kind of independent, because you could multiply with the identity matrix, you will also need at least n squared operations. Yeah, so I'm counting here the number of additions and multiplications in the field. <laughs> and I'm asking how many do I need? Um, so let's simplify it a little bit. I'm only interested in the exponent somehow. So I'm interested in um, what is the optimal exponent. So I want to look at this exponent over here of n. So I don't care if I get a very big constant in front. Yeah, so I only care about very large matrices. So I can have a very big constant in front, and then for n large enough, I will, this, this becomes an interesting parameter. Yeah, so what is the minimum, what is the smallest omega that I can put there? That's the matrix multiplication exponent, and it's called omega. So the question is, what's, it, what's its value? Yeah, so omega is between 3 and 2 by this reasoning. And um, so what should we do? We should come up with better upper bound. So that's, uh, what does it mean? It means we should find algorithms. Upper bounds correspond to algorithms. Or another, another nice word for this is, is construction. So this is really a constructive thing somehow, constructions. And here, these lower bounds, they correspond to non-existence of algorithms, yeah? or obstructions. So non-existence. of algorithms or obstructions. So that's the lower bound. So let me tell you what's known. You can see this. Um, what's known? So 3.0, 2.0, 1.0. All right, so 3.0 we start, yeah? And then, so what happened in 1968? Strassen, Volker Strassen, came up with an algorithm to do it better, yeah? And the exponent he, ob he obtained is roughly 2.8. So that's the first improvement. I should mark this, so 7, 8, 9, So we're here. And then, so not much happened until 1978. And in 1978, lots of things happened. So a, a large group of people um, improved and improved and improved the exponent uh, to something like 2.5. So I draw a curve. It was not a curve, of course, but I cannot. Yeah, so this is a whole bunch of papers uh, moving it down to like 2.5. And then again, not much happened until like 1987. And there, Strassen again and Corpus in Wienergrad, they improved the bound down to like 2.37. And uh, from there, so it roughly, so until now, it has roughly stayed at 2.37, up to, up to some improvements in the, in the further digits. So there's more work, recent work. <laughs> but I can't, you can't really see it. <laughs> so that's, uh, so this is the best upper bound over time. So now, but how about the best lower bound over time? So I told you about 2.0. Uh, so now, 
Now I have to be I have to be careful and draw this correctly. So we get this lower bound curve, which is a perfectly straight line, all the way up to 2018. <laughs> <laughs> so this is 2.0, and this is like 2.37 something. So yeah, nothing happened. But it's not it's not entirely true. So stuff happened. So there there is there has been progress on the theory of, of lower bounds. On, on the matrix multiplication exponent. And, and so the most important figure in this theory, I think, is Volker Strassen. So he has, he has three papers around this period. <laughs> and, uh, and I will explain you a little bit about it. Um, very few people have read those papers, I, I feel, of, always. Um, and I want to mention a recent improvement uh, <laughs> over here. So yeah, <laughs> a theoretical improvement. <laughs> So, so this theory of Strassen is called the asymptotic spectrum of tensors, or the theory of asymptotic spectrum of tensors. Um, so it's about tensors. So two asymptotic spectrum of tensors. So a tensor for me now in this talk is simply a uh, three-dimensional array of numbers in the field. So it's uh, an element of, let's say, this space. That's indexed by three indices, by triple of indices. So what does this have to do with matrix multiplication? Well, so matrix multiplication is a bilinear map, right, from fn squared times fn squared to fn squared. Yeah, I multiply a and b. And I, there's a canonical way of making this into a trilinear map um, from fn squared times fn squared times fn squared to f. Namely, you multiply, you take a and b. Then I take this basis element e, i, j. And it gives me the i, j entry of a times b. Okay. Now, if I have this trilinear map, I can look at its coefficients in the standard basis, and then I get a tensor. Yeah, so that's how, that's how matrix multiplication corresponds to a tensor. So, and I will denote it by mn. So mn is the coefficients of this map. So it lives in fn squared times n squared times n squared. Yeah? Yeah, it does not matter yet. Yeah, it does not matter. Now, so you can think, so th th please think of these tensors as computational problems now. So matrix multiplication is a computational problem. So let's just think of all these tensors as computational problems. Th I haven't really explained how, but just think about it like that. I want to, com I want to compare tensors um, via their complexity somehow. So now I have two tensors, T and S. And I want to compare them. I want to say that uh, oh, this doesn't I should stay low. I want to say that S is smaller than T, so easier than T, um, if there are uh, matrices, three matrices, um, so A i in F M i times N i. such that I can obtain S from T by applying these matrices to the three tensor legs of T. So such that S equals applying these matrices to the three tensor legs. Um, I have to write this out, because otherwise I'm afraid it's not clear. So it's like. For matrices, it means multiplying your matrix from the left and from the right with another matrix. But now I have a tensor, so I, have to, I can apply these three matrices to the three sides of my tensor. But if I write it out, I simply get this. T, A, B, C. So this is the IJK entry. Okay. So 
if t is easy to compute, then somehow do applying these linear maps doesn't do much to the complexity. So if t is easy, easy to compute, if I have a good algorithm for t, then I will get a good algorithm for s. Okay, that's some other intuition. Um, so now I can compare these tensors. I also have some kind of absolute um, measure, and it's called the rank. It's tensor rank. So the rank of a tensor, r of t, is the smallest number n, such that t is at most the n by n by n identity tensor. And this is simply, so it's an n by n by n tensor, and it has ones on the main diagonal and zeros uh, elsewhere. And so, I, so this is somehow a complexity measure. And indeed, if I take the tensor rank of my matrix multiplication tensor, I get roughly I get roughly the complexity of n by n matrix multiplication. Okay, so this is, in that sense, a good a good measure. Um, so I said I, I'm talking about asympto something asymptotic. So I, we haven't done anything asymptotic yet. Um, for this, I first need a tensor product. So on tensors, you can define a Kronecker product. Yeah, so S times T. It, you can do it canonic. Uh, so I will not write it down now. But it lives in this space. Fn1 m1 times n2 m2 times n3 m3. Yeah, so I can multiply two tensors and I have a new tensor. And similarly, you can define a direct sum. Just putting your tensors uh, next to each other, touching in a corner. So now comes the asymptotic measure. It's called asymptotic rank. It's noted by r tilde t. And it's a limit of n going to infinity of the rank of t to the power n, and then the nth root. So rank will not, is not multiplicative under the tensor product. So asymptotic rank is an interesting, something interesting will happen. And in the, ca in the case of matrix multiplication, if you take the asymptotic rank of, say, m2, then we will exactly get 2 to the power omega. And that was what we were after, right? That was the original problem. So we're happy because we wanted to study omega. So now we can study this asymptotic rank. The limit exists. Say it again. The limit exists. And you can replace it with an infimum by Fekete's lemma. And the reason is that the rank is submultiplicative and bounded. That's a good question. Um, so asymptotic rank. So how are we going to study it? Well, through the asymptotic spectrum of tensors, which is the following uh, object. Maybe I switch the boards. So the asymptotic spectrum of tensors, x, is the set of all maps, phi from tensors to the reals, the non-negative reals, such that four properties hold. Um, phi has to be multiplicative. Additive. It has to be normalized on, ident on these identity tensors, so phi of i n equals n. And if a is smaller than b, in the sense which I defined, and phi of a has to be smaller than phi of b. And so x is the set of all these maps. Um, so what's the point of studying this? So Strassen proved, so this is a theorem of Strassen. If you fix a tensor t and you maximize over all elements in x, phi evaluated at t, then you get the asymptotic tensor rank of t. Yeah, so we can study, we can try to study asymptotic tensor rank by studying x. So now our new goal is to learn what x is. And what's important here in this theorem is that 
the asymptotic rank itself is not an element of x. Just a remark. So, are there, yeah. Are there any easy examples of elements of x that I can think of? Yeah, I'm going to give you now three. Yeah. <laughs> and these were the only three that were known before, before we uh, did something here in this dot. Um, so that's the third and last right. elements in X. So uh, three elements were known, and they're called, uh, they come from flattening. So what you do is um, you begin with your tensor T. It lives in this space. I can group together two of these indices, then it becomes a matrix. And of this matrix, I can take the matrix rank. Yeah? Th this grouping, I can do in three ways. I can group them together, th those or, or those two. Yeah? So I get three maps, I get, and I call them F1, F2, F3. And they are, you can prove it's not so hard, they are in X. Yeah? So the rank of, of, the three of, th of each of the three flattenings. And our result, um, so this is the first, yeah, so these are flattenings. Our result um, is it's called the quantum functionals. It's a family of functions, f theta, and they're all in X. And theta is a parameter um, which lives in a, in a simplex. And so it's like a, so an infinite family and are different functions or functions um, in this asymptotic spectrum. So this is joint work with Cristando and Farana. So, yeah, so we found this infinite family. We don't know whether this is everything. Uh, I should also mention, so I mentioned again, this doesn't improve the lower bound on the <laughs> multiplication. <laughs> Um, so let me mention several connections. So the way we construct these quantum functions is through moment polytopes um, and Shannon entropy. And there is a relation with uh, the capset problem and the slice rank. And um, some recent work uh, that I've done is somehow using this, this theory of asymptotic spectra and applying it to another semi-ring. So you, it's now applied to tensors. <coughs> and you can, for example, also apply it to graphs. And then instead of studying the matrix multiplication exponent, you study the Shannon capacity of graphs. So that's some, uh, some recent work. And uh, that's uh, where I want to end. Thanks.